Thank you, Vitek. Um, many of you may already have heard about the term chevron, um, describing large scale sedimentary structures on shore or sediment bodies. And probably many of you may also have followed the ongoing, quite controversial discussion on the origin of these chevrons. So whether these chevrons are uh, the result of large-scale mega-tsunami inundation or maybe just the result of Aeolian uh, sediment transport. So in this talk, I first give an introduction on the original idea, and then I'm going to discuss whether this uh, hypothesis is still valid or not. Well, the whole discussion started in uh, 2003. A group called the Holocene Impact Working Group, uh, which are researchers from different disciplines and different countries, came up with this paper um, describing chevron-shaped accumulations in Australia and relating those uh, ac <laughs> accumulations to tsunami evidence. So they described these general V-shaped um, structures as leaf or blade-like, and they um, also mentioned that these chevrons reach several kilometers inland and also to altitudes more than 100 meters above present sea level. And finally, they conclude that these structures need to be the result of a mega tsunami. Well, in 2008, a second paper from the same group came out, um, this time only using Google Earth. So they surveyed the coastlines of the world using Google Earth, and they mapped the occurrence of all chevron-type deposits. And in their conclusions, um, they exclude a young Aeolian origin of these um, deposits because the orientation of the central axis of these chevrons is not consistent with the current wind direction. Well, and secondly, um, they said there is no beach or other sediment source available currently to feed these structures. And additionally, they exclude any storm storm surge origin because these chevrons are far too big and far uh, too much inland to be um, deposited by a storm surge. So again, they concluded that these must be mega tsunamis. Um, this is one of the most essential figures in their 2008 um, publication, and it shows the geomorphology of different chevron types. And they all have this general V-shaped uh, shape. And uh, looking here at the scale, the chevrons are several kilometers long, and they can be several tens or hundreds of meters wide. What they all have in common is that the central spine faces landwards, and in the case of the chevrons, this is in transport direction. Um, the most common type are these uh, parabolic chevrons with a central depression, and this central depression can be sediment-free. And others are more solid, like here, the tongue-shaped chevrons or the broad leaf-like chevrons. Well, this is how the chevrons, or at least two types, look on Google Earth. A group of leaf-like young chevrons in Australia, they don't have any vegetation on top. <coughs> and in comparison, these are parabolic chevrons. Here is the central depression. This is a picture from California and um, they have vegetation on top, so they are somehow older. Well, what are the arguments of the Holocene Impact Group uh, to say that chevrons are due to mega tsunamis? And these are the most important arguments. So first of all, chevrons can reach even nearly 50 kilometers inland and reach uh, heights of nearly 200 meters above current sea level. So they are not due to any storm surge uh, activity um, and they are not washover deposits. Um, they can contain marine organisms. The grain size is far too big for Aeolian transport. Um, as I said before, the alignment of the axis is not consistent with the wind direction and they exist where currently no um, sediment sources available and most of all they are currently inactive. So if chevrons are really the result of a mega tsunami, then we, of course, have to ask, why does this Holocene impact group say it 
should be an impact tsunami. And of course, it's mainly the size and, and, and the location of these chevrons, because normal earthquake triggered tsunami, for example, wouldn't reach uh, um, sites as far as 50 kilometers inland, of course. Um, and so this is a map uh, also from their 2008 publication, and it depicts all chevron sites. So each of these red points here is a chevron or a group of chevrons, and the attached line here indicates the alignment of the main axis of those chevrons. So again, looking on this map, looking at Sumatra or Japan, where we had large, big earthquake triggered tsunamis during the last years, you can see there are no chevron structures. So earthquake triggered tsunamis um, do not seem to be responsible for the deposition of chevrons. And then instead, looking at the map, uh, chevrons seem to occur quite randomly around the world. And so what the impact group basically did is they uh, proposed different impact sites. Uh, for example, they extrapolated the, um, the axis of the chevrons out into the ocean. And there are certain points where some of these axes come together, and this is where the proposed impacts. For example, the Brocklo impact site should be responsible for um, the deposition of chevrons in southern Madagascar. Well, then in 2009, Jody Bourgeois and Robert Weiss published a paper saying chevrons are not, not mega tsunami deposits. And what they did is they used the Brockel uh, impact site in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the impact should have an age of roughly uh, 4.5 to 5,000 years before present. And they modeled uh, impact tsunami uh, caused by impact at this site. And what they were able to show was that um, the alignment of the main chevron axis here in, in black is not consistent with the tsunami run-up direction here with the red arrows. And this is, of course, uh, because the tsunami uh, bends towards the course in regard to the basimetric lines. So they were able to show that this impact site and the chevrons could not be linked. So I and probably many of you thought that the discussion would have come to an end with this paper. But this was not the case. A few months later, another paper came out from the same group saying mega tsunamis in the world oceans and again mentioning chevron dunes as evidence. So how to finally end the discussion? Well, the main problem is that there is no thorough field data available. Um, so we have no information about the real thicknesses, the grain size, any internal structures or the depositional ages. And what we finally did, we went into the field to Oregon, California, Central Chile, and Western Australia to study the chevrons in the field. And this is how two types <coughs> look like. This is Point Reyes, just a few tens of kilometers north of San Francisco. And this is a parabolic chevron. You see the central dep depression in here, and it's somehow old. It's having vegetation on top. And in comparison here, this is a tongue-shaped chevron, or several of them, uh, in Western Australia on top of a cliff. Um, yeah, and the methods we used, first of all, were ground-penetrating radar to get an idea of the internal structures and then refer to transport processes. And if we found find soils, we could also state if there were active or stable phases uh, during the development of these structures. We analyzed the grain size and the mineral content, again, to get an idea about transport processes, for example, sorting and transport direction, and to refer to sediment sources. Well, um, if there were microorganisms or organisms inside, we try to find out if they were of marine origin, because this could give an idea about the water depths of sediment entrainment. Um, and finally, we use optical stimulated luminescence dating and radiocarbon dating to get the depositional ages. So the dating did not only help to get the actual ages of the sediments, but also to um, distinguish between short-term event deposits by a, a tsunami or long-term aeolian deposition. And this is, of course, quite easy. If the whole sediment body was deposited during one tsunami event, all the sediments should have the same age. Uh, and it, if it was an aeolian deposit, a dune, the ages should get younger in transport direction. So the chevrons should get younger landwards. 
And this is one of our surveys uh, with the ground penetrating radar. I picked the point raised site because many of you might know it. Um, this is a tongue-shaped chevron. This is the beach of Point Reyes. The Pacific Ocean would be here. And this is our radar profile. Um, you can see three important things here. First of all, these dipping layers here. These layers dip inland with um, angles between 20 and 24 degrees. So this is quite typical for uh, forced bedding of dunes. And then secondly, there is here and here we have two reflector horizons and we dug trenches to see what these horizons represent and we found that these are soil layers. So in the case of this uh, chevron at Point Reyes, we have evidence of at least two stable phases and afterwards the reactivation. So um, the transport of sediments stopped for a while, um, soil developed and then sediment transport went on. And looking at the ages here, you can see that uh, the chevron gets younger in inland direction. So 2,000 years, roughly 1,500 and roughly 700 years before present. Um, this is another section here. It's through the arms of a parabolic chevron. And what you can see here is the avalanching of the sediments down the flanks of these arms. And this is a field picture. Um, and you also can see that the base of the chevrons is, of course, older than the top. Well, at some places we were also able to eyewitness the current sediment transport, so these chevrons are currently active. And most impressive was the site of Tamala in Western Australia, um, where we found that the migration rates are even several meters per year. You can see the trees being uh, covered by, by sand down here. So chevrons are actively migrating and some of them pretty fast. Um, what else did we find? So we find lamination. This is again Point Reyes. Um, and this lamination was due to seasonally uh, changing wind velocities with a um, coarser layer deposited during winter time when the wind was stronger and the finer sediments uh, deposited during summertime. Um, additionally, you can see down here, chevrons are generally quite fine-grained, medium to fine-grained sands. They are unimodal and very well sorted. Um, we compared the reference samples, from example, from rivers or beaches with the chevron um, samples, and we found that the mineral composition and grain size are quite similar. Um, we did not find any marine shells in, um, or recent shells in the chevrons, but what we found were terrestrial gastropods that live in this uh, coastal environment. Well, we found big conch shells, but these conch shells in Australia were all parts of shell mittens, so Aboriginal people brought these, uh, these um, conches on shore. And uh, all the fossil formifera that we found were eroded from the underlying Pleistocene cliffs. So there is no evidence of any marine current source. Well then, finally looking again on the chevron distribution, we have to consider the wind systems in, on different scales. For example, the westerly winds being uh, responsible for chevrons on the US west coast, or seasonal winds or typhoons, tropical storms in uh, northeastern Australia, for example. Regional, local wind systems play an important role, and of course, considering uh, that some chevrons are several thousand of years old, um, sea level has changed during Holocene, and for example, uh, a lower sea level might um, uh, make new sediment sources available, and wind systems might change. And this is an example for the regional wind systems. This is Quapper Point in Western Australia. Here are the chevrons, and these are the main axes of the chevrons. And these are consistent with the uh, main wind directions. This is a road diagram from a nearby airport. And you see um, the wind coming from south and southeast. And so the most important messages are that the tsunami or impact tsunami uh, hypothesis is not longer ac acceptable. Um, this is because the internal structures are typical for dunes. Um, the depositional ages also support the long-term um, development, and several chevrons are currently active and migrating. 
So they are not related to any mega tsunami, and of course they are of uh, Aeolian origin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, an extremely short question.